chapter 17. One of the just wonderful stories that transpired when Jesus walked upon earth. I've preached out of this text on two occasions. Uh, had that one message I, I've enjoyed. I've never got to preach again. Uh, but I've looked at it many times and he couldn't be here. Account of his transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17, verse number 1 says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun. His raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We sure do thank you for the testimony of the saints of God. We thank you for the good singing. We're thankful you're faithful. We're thankful you're our friend. Lord, we're certainly thankful that, Lord, uh, regardless of what state we find ourselves in, we can call upon thee can look unto the hills from whence cometh our help. Lord, we find strength and help in time of need. And Father, as we come tonight, we come seeking your face and hungering and thirsting for your power and your presence. Lord, without you, we can do nothing. Lord, we do pray you continue to comfort Miss Janet and the loss of her brother and certainly comfort Brother Darrell and his children and their family. Uh, Lord, in the loss of his mother-in-law. God, we pray that, Lord, those that may be facing uh, trials and storms, they'd find a refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and find some help. Lord, we pray for those that are working with the children on the other side of the building. You'd bless their efforts. I pray for those children. Thank you for saving many of them in the last couple years. Lord, if there's any here tonight that haven't been saved, we pray the sweet word of God would uh, find a lodging place in their heart began to take root, we pray we'd see them saved at a young age. And Lord, save them out of a lot of heartache and trouble. Lord, we pray for them working with the teens. You'd bless their efforts as well. All the peer pressure upon these young people today. Lord, I pray you'd hedge them in with your good grace. And God, you'd do work in their heart that they might uh, hide the word of God in their heart also that they might not sin against thee. Now, Father, I do pray you'd meet every need of every heart. Lord, I pray for those that are sick and afflicted. You'd touch them. Those that are providentially hindered, you'd help them. I do pray for Brother Doug. You'd touch him. Pray for Brother Bobby and Brother Greg. You'd touch them. Brother J.D., you'd touch him. Pray for Miss Pam, who's sick. You'd touch her. I do pray for Brother Ron. Miss Rhonda's uh, daughter, Andrea. You know what she stands in need of. Touch her tonight. Father, meet uh, 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 these needs, and God certainly... Uh, Reveal unto us our spiritual needs and meet them tonight as well. Father, be with those that were in the service this morning that left lost. Uh, God, I pray wherever they are right now, you'd continue to convict them of sin that we might see them born again. Bless now. Get glory to your name. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll thank you for it. For it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ we do pray. Amen. Amen. I, this is a little thought that I had this morning I told you about. I couldn't get away from uh, 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 but I got this little thing here I want to share with you. I want you to notice, first of all, uh, if you will, uh, uh, the privileged. In verse number 1, we find that uh, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John high up into a mountain. Uh, Peter, James, and John are often referred to uh, as the inner circle. Uh, Jesus had 12 disciples, uh, and he's no respecter of persons. Uh, it wasn't that he preferred one above the others. Uh, it just seems every time he needed a, a, a special occasion, these three were privileged uh, to get to hang out with the Lord. Uh, maybe it's because they loved him more than the others. Uh, maybe it's they, they were a little more committed than the others. Uh, 
But for whatever reason, Peter, James, and John not only got the privilege to see things that others didn't, but they went on and God used them in great capacities because of their love for Jesus. We see the privilege, Peter, James, and John. Notice, if you will, not only that, notice the providence of Christ. Look in verse number 2. And he was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. You and I that are Bible believers know that Jesus left glory, stepped into the womb of the Virgin Mary, was born into this world. He that is Alpha and Omega, He that is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, He that is the beginning and the ending, He walked out of glory and wrapped Himself in flesh, came into this world uh, to become our kinsman redeemer, uh, to go to the cross of Calvary, pay our sin debt, uh, shed his blood that you and I might have life, uh, have it more abundantly. Uh, uh, by this time he's already been on the earth uh, uh, some 31, 32 years. And in the midst of that, uh, he no longer could hide who he was. Think about it. His flesh gave way to who he was. But he was so much God, even his raiment changed. I don't know about you, but if I'm there, I'd go. Peter, James, and John knew that he was the Christ. And they knew he was God. But they didn't know he was that much God. Huh? You know how you and I know that he's the Savior and that he's Lord and that He's our Lord, but yet when He answers our prayers, we're shocked. They're walking with Him. He's feeding them. He's preaching to them. He's touching uh, uh, people's lives. He's done seeing Him uh, 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 feed the multitudes with a few fish and a few uh, 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 pieces of bread. He's uh, done seen Him raise the dead. He's done seen Him. They've, they've seen Him do all these great things, but they really hadn't seen Him. That day they saw Him. Uh, can you imagine? They just went, woo. Uh, I can't imagine. I mean, I get up every day, look toward the eastern sky, thinking today's the day I might see him. But Brother Bob, they really saw him. Hmm? He just transfigured uh, right before them. He had to do something for them that they could see. Him. Because remember... He told Moses, no man can see me in the flesh and live. But they saw him. That's blowing my mind now. We see the providence of Christ. We see the privilege. Notice the patriarchs in verse number 3. And behold, behold there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. I mean, it's, it, it, it wasn't enough that it blew their mind to see Jesus as Jesus. But now, all of a sudden, Moses and Elias shows up. Elijah. Hmm? I mean, they got to absolutely be boggled beyond comprehension. Hmm? Now, notice the patriarchs. There's a picture that is being displayed here. The picture, Moses, represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And they're there talking with Jesus. Now, notice the presence of God. Verse number 5. We're talking about the Father decides to get in on this. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Now this is a tremendous event. Not only are the privilege there, and they see Christ transformed, and transfigure into who he is. They see Moses and Elijah, but now all of a sudden the Father shows up. And the Father continues the picture. He says, you got Moses the law, you got Elijah the prophets, but here's my son. Hear ye him. This represents the fact the law of the prophets are about ready to give away to the gospel. Jesus Christ came full of grace and truth. And he came to give the gospel to the whole world. 
The law had its place. It brought us to the knowledge of sin. The prophets had their place. Uh, 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 it prophesied of him and all that would transpire uh, uh, from when he came to when he comes again. But none of that matters without the gospel. He said, hear ye him. We see that. Notice, the Bible says there in verse 5, that a bright, bright cloud overshadowed them. You know, throughout the Bible, God overshadows some things. In other words, uh, it's an, a, a way that God can approach man without man really seeing God. We see here that he used a cloud. In the Old Testament, he used a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Hmm? Can I say this? Uh, he used a consumless bush to call Moses. He overshadowed them. He showed up in a bush and got Moses' attention. He said, I've got to go check out this thing. It's on fire, but it's not being consumed. Uh, uh, can I say he used the cleft of the rock in Moses' life uh, uh, to overshadow where Moses got to see the glory of God. Uh, 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 we find uh, 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 in Jesus' life he was clothed in flesh. Uh, he was overshadowed. God was approaching man, but man could not really see who God was. Uh, and then, my dear friends, uh, uh, for you and I, he uses the canon of Scripture. Uh, 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 we actually have God's Word uh, on exactly God's thoughts and God's will for our life. Uh, 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 when you look into the pages of God's Word, you will see God, my dear friends. Uh, but what I'm interested in, my little thought, here's these three. Privileged to go on this mountain. Privilege to see Jesus transfigured. Privilege to see Moses and Elijah. Privilege to hear the very voice of God. They were close. And yet they were clueless. How close do we get to God and we really don't have a clue? What's well, really all this is about. There are still people that believe come to church as service. Come to church as worship. We serve Him outside the doors of the church. There are a lot of folks that really believe that uh, in order to have some kind of a, a, a confidence in themselves, they need to have some kind of position around the church. You're clueless. Hmm? You, you better have a position in Christ. If you got a position in Him, it don't matter about anything else. Hmm? People get close, but they're clueless. Joe's, uh, 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 Joe's, um, Judas Iscariot kissed the face of Jesus, then he died and went to hell. He was close. But he was clueless. A lot of times even people approach the altar of God. They get close. But they pick up their burden. They take it back with them. They're clueless that Jesus can carry their burdens. There's three little points I want to bring out. And this will make more sense to you. First of all, I want you to notice the error in our text. Look, if you will, in verse number 4. Now, Moses and Elijah is talking with Jesus. He's transfigured before them. Verse number 4, Then answered Peter. Of course Peter's going to speak up. I guarantee you there are some people, if service gets on, you open up the floor for testimony, there's some people, they're going to say something or die, whether God's in it or not. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Now, if he'd have stopped right there, we'd be all right. Lord, it's good for us to be We're having a time, Lord. Thank you for letting us see all this. Been all right. You know, but in much speaking, people really reveal their ignorance. It'd be good if some people just learned to keep their mouth shut. It'd be good if some people realized their mouth is big enough to fit both their feet, so just keep it shut. Mm. But here's old Peter. Here's where the error comes in. Notice what he says. Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt. Now he's trying to make it sound spiritual. Mm. Uh, he's adding a thee and thou. Thou, Lord God Almighty, we bless thee with all of our blessing. You know, he's trying to be real spiritual here. If thou wilt. 
let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Well, first of all, Peter's a fisherman. How's he going to make a tabernacle? Huh? And where are they going to get the resources and the money to build three? The more you're looking at this statement, it's pretty ignorant. But notice what he really says. He says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Shut up, Peter. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. We can make it a theme park. Everybody just come, uh, check it all out. You know what he's really saying? He's really saying, Jesus, you, Moses, and Elijah are all equal. He's bringing Jesus down and elevating Moses and Elijah to be on an equal playing field. In other words, he's saying... Moses and Elijah ought to be part of the Godhead. I don't know about you, but that's, a, that's an error. Jesus doesn't share his glory with anybody. Hmm? Very, very important. Now let me bring it down to how it affects us. Do you know any time we elevate anything to where the significance Jesus should be, we're just as ignorant as Peter? Hmm? Jesus we love you we worship you you're our best friend uh, we bless your holy name uh, but Jesus you've got to understand I've got this going on today and I can't come to church do you realize there are people who put family on the same playing field as Jesus Lord my family's so important I've got to go do this with them today I know you understand no, he doesn't. Hmm? I know your family's important. But Jesus said, if you love father or mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. Jesus said, if you love daughter or son more than me, you're not worthy of me. Hmm? He doesn't understand. But yet there are people that elevate family to the same place in their life as Jesus. Do you know there are people who elevate their job to the same position as Jesus. Now listen, let me qualify this. It's one thing if you have to work and you have to miss church. It's another thing if you choose to work to miss church. Hmm? There are some of you, you have no choice. Uh, 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 we live in a day uh, where there's a sleepless society, where there's something going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, there are some people uh, that are even here tonight, uh, but they'll get up real early in the morning when some of you haven't even went to bed yet uh, 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 to go and start their job. Uh, and there are some uh, who have to work uh, uh, on Wednesday night. There are some who have to work on Sunday night. There are some who have to work on Sunday morning. Uh, and until Jesus uh, works out their shift or gives them a better job that's just the fact of the matter uh, uh, that's called being providentially hindered uh, God knows when it's out of your control uh, but there are others uh, who decide they want a little more trinkets around their neck uh, or a little more toys in the garage uh, or a little more things going on uh, and they choose to miss the house of God in other words they tell Jesus we're building a tabernacle to our job I know you understand hmm can I say, there are people who elevate their children to the same plateau as Jesus. Lord Jesus, I know you understand you gave me these children, uh, uh, but uh, I want them to have the best that there is in life. Uh, so Jesus, I'm going to allow them to be a part of everything, even if it pulls us out of the house of God. He doesn't understand. Thank you, Brother Ron. Uh, well, uh, God will understand. No, He doesn't. Mm. I understand we live in a day and age that isn't like it was years ago, but the best thing you can ever put into your children is the things of God. Everybody's so interested in their children being well-rounded. 
And everybody's so interested uh, in giving their children all the opportunities that life gives them uh, 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 that they'll sacrifice the most important thing, Jesus, for their children. Mm -mm. All you got to do is be around somebody and you find out real quick. Let little Johnny or little Susie get, get called on by the teacher and then all of a sudden the teachers are terrible. Let little Johnny or Susie not get in the ball game and the coaches are terrible. Hmm? Listen, I don't mean to be ugly. Let me come down here and sit in your lap. <laughs> I don't mean to be ugly. But I'm no fool. Okay? I was about this close to the major leagues. I've been around athletics all my life. And we try to get around and see all the kids. And we've got some talented kids in the, in the church. But I'm here to tell you, I don't see any pros here in the church. I don't see any that's going on to the next level here in the church. I really don't. I'm not trying to be unkind. Now, maybe somebody have a growth spurt and end up six foot nine. You cannot coach height. If you're six foot nine, you're getting a scholarship until they see you can't catch and can't run. But I'm here to tell you that you are spending a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of money that are taking your kids away from the most important thing. And Jesus doesn't understand. Hmm? Listen, she hasn't played in three years. There's not a kid in here that can take her. He hasn't played in 20 years. There's not a kid in here that can take him. I haven't played in 40 years. There's not a kid in here that can take me. Hmm? Say, what are you trying to say? They're just not that talented. Huh? I know you love seeing them play. I love seeing them play. But just keep the main thing the main thing is what I'm trying to say. When you start letting that control your life, you are building a tabernacle and you're bringing Jesus down to their level. He doesn't understand it. Hmm? Let me help you again since I've made you mad. There's a lot of people that have built a tabernacle to covid COVID rules their life and not Jesus. Listen, from day one, I learned early on that if I'm going to get COVID, it's got to come through Jesus' hand, and Jesus is in control. And if I die of COVID, oh well, I get to go to glory. I mean, it's not that rough, all right? But yet, we m m manipulate our entire lives around COVID. When all it is is the same, same thing we've been facing for 50 years, the flu and the cold. That's all it is. Matter of fact, I know you all don't read, and I don't like getting on all this junk because I have to hear from Miss Annette. She said, I'm tired of hearing about COVID. i got to deal with it every day at work. i got to deal with it all the time. I'm tired of it. The CDC came out last week and finally admitted what I've been preaching for two years, that the natural herd immunity is better than the vaccine. They said it last week. It's in print. It's all over. Just read. They admitted what we've been saying. The best thing you do is get exposed to it and then get over it. But yet, some of you have had three and four and ten shots and you still get sick. You know why? Because the vaccine wasn't ever designed to keep you from getting COVID. The vaccine was designed to control you, to manipulate you, to have you answer to the government. It's all getting ready for the Antichrist. But yet there are people in churches building tabernacles to COVID. Mm -mm. I'd just rather hang out with Jesus. People elevate their families. They elevate their children. They elevate their jobs. They elevate their teams. They elevate everything. Jesus, you've got to understand. Where's the crowd tonight that was here this morning? Hmm? Now, I know we got probably 25 or 30 over there, but where's the crowd? Huh? I'll tell you where they are. They're worshiping something other than Jesus tonight. Now, there's some that are sick. There's some that are providentially hindered. But there's some that's built a tabernacle to something else tonight. That's an error. Something worth repenting over.
Now listen, we're all made of flesh. You know, and I read Romans 7. I've read what Paul said. There's times when that which I should do, I don't do. And there's times when there's things I shouldn't do and I end up doing them. Oh, wretched man that I am. There are times your body does not want to come to church. There are times your mind doesn't want to read the Bible. There are times your knees do not want to bend and pray. I understand there are times this flesh does not want to be spiritual. Well, that's when the inner man has to take over. Sometimes uh, when you don't feel good, when you don't feel like it, when it doesn't make sense, uh, just go ahead and put Jesus first anyway. Uh, go ahead and pray. Go ahead and sing. Go ahead and worship. Uh, and when it's all said and done, your old flesh will start feeling better. So many times. We make provision for the flesh and we act just like Peter on that mountain. We bring Jesus down and elevate something else to his equal. And there's nobody like Jesus. We see the error. Now notice the embarrassment. Look at verse 5. While he yet spake, Peter hadn't even finished his ignorant thought. He'd said enough ignorance to get God's attention. God had already had enough. said, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. In the midst of Peter speaking, uh, the Father said, That's enough. And God showed up and embarrassed him, shut his mouth, uh, and said, This is my beloved son, not Moses, uh, not Elijah. Moses and Elijah don't deserve a temple or tabernacle. Uh, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. What an embarrassment. You know why sometimes you go through a lot in life? God's embarrassing you because you've made something else equal with Jesus. Mm -mm. God embarrassed him right there in front of everybody. He should have been embarrassed just opening his mouth in that scene. Uh, can I say how I've been in the presence of God and around some older men of God? I'm talking about men of God that have blazed the trail. Men of God that have known more about God than I'll ever know. And invariably we'll be in a scene where God's a moving and God's a, and some young punk, punk preacher that don't even know how to tie his shoes will stand up and try and tell them old men of God something. That's just like Peter right here. I want to tell you something. There was a time if I was able and, and it worked out, if any time I was around uh, uh, picking South Carolina, I'd go see Roy Goodson. Roy Goodson preached the gospel for 67 years. And I'd go see Brother Roy, and you know what I'd tell Brother Roy? Nothing. I'd just sit there and listen to him talk. Huh? That old man of God had forgotten more about God than I'll ever know. And he'd just start talking about how back in the day when God moved and what God did and what God did here and what God showed him here and what God did there. And I just sat there like a kid in a candy store and sopped it up. Hmm? You can be quick to pop off and quick to build a tabernacle and quick to do it. But I want to tell you something. God's got a way of embarrassing you. God embarrassed Peter right there. And God straightened him out. By the way, when God embarrasses you, he always straightens you out. Hmm? We see there, we see the embarrassing, but notice the emancipating. Hmm? I want you to see something here. Verse number 6, And when the disciples heard the voice of God, they did what they should have done all along. Look what happens. They fell on their face and were sore afraid. I'm here to tell you, if I'm standing there and all of a sudden Jesus that I've known for a couple of years turns into God, I'm going to be freaked out and I'm going to be on my face. That didn't impact them. How many times do we come to church and Jesus shows up and it doesn't impact people? They don't fall on their face in fear and trembling before God. Hmm? But yet they're so afraid. When the Father showed up to embarrass Peter and to set, set him straight, it set them all straight. Insomuch that Moses and Elijah said, it's time for us to go. Hmm. Uh, but look what happens. And Jesus came and touched them. Aren't you glad when he comes by and touches you? 
even when you've blown it, even when you've made a fool out of yourself, even when you've been ignorant, even when you've uh, 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 made a, a big mess of things, aren't you glad he still comes by your way? He come by and he touched them, and he said, Arise, be not afraid. Aren't you? I don't know about you. There have been times I failed God and I was afraid to breathe, and God just come by and say, It's okay. Hmm? Uh, it's all right. Huh? He said, Don't be afraid. Arise. Huh? Now look in verse number 8. Here's the emancipating. And when they lift up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Now, I don't know if Moses and Elijah had fled or not. But I do know after they looked up, they didn't see anybody else but Jesus. It would be a good day in your eyes and my eyes when we quit looking around and we start looking at him. It would be a good day in our eyes when he becomes the plan. When he becomes the person. When he becomes our all in all. It, it'd be great to have our eye when we, we end up not being clueless. We get a clue. It's all about him. Hmm? They were close and clueless to this point. Now all of a sudden they, they saw no man save Jesus only. And my dear friends, when we get to the point where it's all about him, you'll not see anybody else either. You'll not be listening to any other voice either. You'll not be following them down any other path either. You won't be looking to build any kind of tabernacle to anybody else either. You'll just be looking at him. You'll be listening to him. You'll be longing for him. You know, what a, what a foolish thing, build a tabernacle. How about you just go in and let Jesus use you to build his church? That's what he wanted to do. But until they were set free of all those foreign ideals and all those foreign things, they didn't see Jesus only. Hmm? From this point on. He's got their attention. Should have had it all along. I wonder. Sometimes we need to be emancipated. Sometimes there are things that need to be set free from us. Our ideologies, our philosophies. Huh? Well, since I've made some of you mad, I'm just going to make you good and mad because the thought's on my mind, and if I don't say it, then I'm going to be all jacked up all night long. So I'm just going to say it. Then I'm going to go home, eat a banana and peanut butter sandwich, go to bed. No, not really. There are some of you, you miss more church than the rest of the church combined. Why do you miss so much church? It's the same patterns of the same people all the time. Missing church. And it amazes me how if little Susie gets a runny nose, the whole family's out. Or if the wife gets a cold or has a stomach flu, then the whole family's got it. Well, they're not sick, but they can't come to church. And there's some of you pattern after pattern after pattern you just miss church. Well, here's my question. Do you miss work the next day? Because if you don't miss work, and you miss church, what do you think that does to Jesus? I've been tempted to keep a record book of who misses church. But I don't have that much ink in the ink pens I've got. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus is keeping the record. And he neither slumbers or sleeps. He not only knows that you miss church, he knows why you miss church. Hmm? You know how many times I've had to come and mount this pulpit not feeling well? Do you think that I do it because I want to be Superman? No, I'm not Superman. I'm not even Superman shorts. No. I'm going to be not feeling well at the house. So why sit around there? I can come out and be at the house of God. Now, I'm not talking about if you've got something that is deadly. Even though there have been times I was pretty deadly and I still came. But I will say this invariably. Every time I've come on the house of God, God's helped me. There have been times I've preached with a migraine headache, felt like two mules were in my mind kicking my brains out. I didn't even know what I was saying, but God helped me. 
There have been times, and you know it, when my back, I couldn't even stand, but I stood. There been times when my neck, I couldn't, couldn't feel my hands, but I still stood. Why? Because what's in my heart means a whole lot more than what's in the rest of my body. And so I have a hard time understanding people got a runny nose, and it knocks the whole family out. You know what you're doing? You're building a tabernacle to a runny nose. It's a dangerous thing. You wonder why you don't have any power of God? You wonder why God don't answer your prayers? You wonder why you, your family don't get right with God? You wonder why? It's because of you. You're building tabernacles to the wrong things. You start building a tabernacle to Jesus in your heart, He'll handle the rest of it. So, so I'm, not, I'm not preaching works. I'm preaching a love for God. If you've got a love for God right, he'll handle the rest of it, friend. I tell my Sunday school class, it's the truth. Do you know how much I pray and ask God for my personal needs? Zero. I don't pray and ask God for personal needs. I pray and ask God for your needs. I figure if I spend enough time praying for you, God will just look at me and say, well, you know what? He's doing such a, such a job praying for everybody else. I'll just help him. And he does. If you seek him first in the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else he just adds up to you, including health. Now, I know tonight's been a wonderful, lovely message. But the truth of the matter is, too many of God's people are building tabernacles or they got ignorant thoughts in their mind because they got their eyes off of Jesus. If you just keep your eyes on Him and keep Him elevated and give Him your whole heart, every issue that I've said it's made people mad. And I didn't even bring up Facebook. Thank you. Every one of those issues will be solved. And Jesus will get glory from your life. Friend, the only thing that matters is that you're born again. And after that, when you get to glory, the only thing that will matter is whether or not your life after you got saved glorified Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. Nothing else matters. But yet we get wrapped up with so much temporal stuff that Jesus don't matter. And we wonder why revival hadn't come to America in over 100 years. We wonder why churches are closing or dwindling down to nothing. We wonder why people don't want to come to church. We wonder why people don't have a song that touches people's lives or people don't have a message that touches people. It's because Jesus doesn't matter in the lives and hearts of those that call him God. God help us to live in verse number 8. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. God help us to keep our eyes on the Master. I don't want to get close and be clueless. I want to walk hand in hand with Him and be well aware of who He really is. Let's all stand tonight. Maybe God spoke to your heart. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come do business. Maybe tonight you got mad at the preacher. Well, the altar's open. Brother Ray, you come. Get a song of invitation. I don't know where all that came from, but I know one thing. Too many people building too many tabernacles, too many things other than Jesus. And then picking out a song, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, you're the one who put all that thought in my mind. I don't know where a lot of that came from, but Lord, I didn't ever speak anything to hurt anybody. But Lord, we'll, we're guilty of that. We'll throw off on Peter, but we're just as guilty. We build tabernacles to all kinds of things in our lives other than you. It amazes me how in this year that we live in, people are so quick to justify their unfaithfulness. And God, they look down if we say that you've got to put Jesus first. God, help us. Help us to see no man only, save Jesus only. And God, help us to keep our focus where it needs to be. Help us to get more than close. Help us to get all the way to the center of God's will. 
and Lord, to understand what it is to serve Jesus. Lord, you've given us another year. This might be the year you come, or it might be the year you send revival. Lord, either way, help us, Lord, to be found right in the smack dab of your will. Blessing this invitation. Folks have already come. Speak to hearts. And glorify your name. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn- if you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.